This is Adam Gorney with the Respect My Decision podcast. This week's guest is Mark Passwaters from AggieL.com. And there's a lot to talk about with Texas A&M, especially coming off of another loss and three in a row now. It's, it's been a long month of October for the Aggies. Let's take the 30,000-foot view here before we get into the specifics of what's really wrong. But what's kind of going on in this program now? Because things are not as anticipated at all. Uh, well, yeah, things are definitely not what w- was anticipated. I think you've got a bunch of things that are coming to a head all at once. Uh, one, they've had tremendous injury issues. Uh, they've had 21 players uh, that I would have figured to be in the 2D missing at least one game. So that's crazy. You've had all kinds of issues at quarterback, you know, with injuries. Max Johnson getting hurt. Haynes King is playing hurt. Uh, Connor Wiegman had to come in last week. The offensive line has been terrible. I don't think that the the coaching change there, uh, bringing in Steve Adazio, has worked at all. Uh, and the offensive scheme has just finally been exposed. And I say exposed, and that might not be the right word. It's just old. And it's been it was effective 10 years ago. It was effective five years ago. It's not now. People have seen enough film on it. They know what to do. Uh, you know, I think it was pretty obvious. South Carolina was expecting several out routes that came their way and they jumped them. They knew yeah. what was coming. So I think that uh, there's going to be some changes there uh, in the offseason in terms of offensive coordinator and scheme. And, uh, you know, they brought in this number one ranked class in the, the country. And is you know as well as anybody that not every single player in every single class, especially high caliber ones, works out. And that's what they're finding out now. ESPN a few weeks ago actually wrote a really interesting story about Jimbo Fisher's offensive scheme. And basically the argument was that it works. It's proven to have worked, but you need the guys to have been in it for a long time to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And, And I understand this argument that it's so complicated that maybe People aren't grasping it quickly and need time to do it. But why make it so complicated then? Why does it have to be like that? And so that's the question here is, is the offense so complicated that players are just not using their athleticism and being free to to sort of be who they are and just sort of going through the motions of what Jimbo wants? And why doesn't Jimbo just simplify that? Uh, I think that one thing, you know, starting at the end is, He's stubborn. He's proven that in the past. I mean, all coaches are egotistical. I mean, we know that. Uh, All coaches can be stubborn. And he has had success in the past. I mean, this is a guy who won, what, 27 straight games or something at FSU. Uh, Had A&M as the number four team in the country and Orange Bowl champions just two years ago. But, you know, as time goes on, and I used the example a couple of weeks ago, it's like Joe Gibbs – you and I both know it. The Redskins had the greatest offense going yeah. in the 80s and early 90s. And then he left and retired and came back. And they couldn't get things going early in his time because everybody knew it was coming because they had co-opted his scheme. Yeah. And, you know, they, they'd studied it. They'd seen it. They'd taken what they liked and, and used it. So it just didn't work anymore. So he had to adjust. And I think that that's to the, the point where A&M is is Jimbo's got to adjust or perish. And, hey, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. In this case, the straight line is you make some changes, you've got the good talent, this will maximize their abilities. But, I mean, when you go out there on the practice field and you hear him yell out all these things, it's like, this is stuff you hear in the NFL. Yeah. You know, this is not what you hear uh, on on other practice fields where it's, you know, the – the receiver can do X, Y, or Z, and the quarterback is expecting this or wherever. This is very set, very regimented. You will do this as, you know, in and when you see that. And, you know, it is complex. I mean, you know, Connor Wiegman could have played baseball this spring. He decided he was going to come in early and start, you know, learning the playbook and everything. So he's here for spring practice. He was here for the whole summer. Is he still, is he ready now? I don't think so. You know, so that that shows you after a full year that, you know, there's still things that need to be 
uh, learned for him. And that's tough. I mean, for college players, that's extremely tough. And and that's sort of my point is Jimbo seems to be making it complex for complexity's sake, not because the offense needs to run like that. You know, Oregon went up and down against UCLA last weekend in Kenny Dillingham's offense. And, and that's a complex offense, but it's not so difficult to understand that the players stop being athletic, stop being playmakers, stop doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so I think the question now becomes is, is someone at an A&M going to come to him and say, you need to give up the play calling? Uh, yeah. Does, does anyone even have that power? Uh, technically, no. Yeah. But has has it happened? Yeah, I think it has. And I think that he's amenable to it. I mean, he may be ego, he may have a big ego. He may be stubborn, but he's not stupid. I mean, he can read a stat sheet. He knows what's going on. They haven't scored more than two offensive touchdowns since the Sam Houston State game. You know, you've got to make changes because you're not keeping up with everybody else in the SEC. And you've got talent. You've got plenty yeah. of talent. And there's no questioning that. You've seen flashes of it. But, I mean, if you were to go out there and, and dumb down this offense, just make it a whole lot more simple, increase, you know, speed up the pace a little bit, they probably have more success. But I think that he's come to the hard realization that you've got to slog through the rest of this year, and then they're going to make changes. And I think that they already have some people in mind. Uh, you know, I don't want to name names because certainly I don't want to throw up a red flag for another organization to say, hey, they're after our dude, but, um, you know, I think they've narrowed it down to a few guys and, you know, we, we all know that very few, uh, college programs can spend money like a &M. Yeah. That's where it becomes interesting is, okay, we can't change now. We're at Halloween. We have, you know, five games left and then a potentially a bowl game. But at this point, I'm not entirely sure that's true. Um, what does that mean for players on the team and for recruits? Because, you know, this is Jimbo, not year one. And players are like, you know, I'm a very good player. I came here with the promise that we're going to be winning SEC titles and national championships, and I'm going to be putting up big numbers and going to the NFL. And now, you know, they're piecemealing, you know, field goals against South Carolina and, you know, getting blown out by Mississippi State, those kinds of things. Do you see sort of a... And do you see sort of an exodus from this roster, and how does he kind of manage through that? Well, I don't think there's going to be an exodus, but I definitely think you're going to see some some guys go. And yeah. in some cases, it may be addition by sub subtraction. Sure. You know, you've got – anytime you go out there and you get a class of intel incredible talent, and talent is the at the premium, you're going to bring in some guys that just don't fit, whether it's ego, attitude, you know, don't like the scheme, what have you you know, they, they're just not going to work. And we've seen that over and over. You know, I said the other night that if you have a hit rate of two thirds in a recruiting class, you're having a great class. That's right. just how it is. I mean, if you have a 29 guy class and you can say 21 of these guys, you know, were, were serious, uh, you know, assets, then you'll take that and you'll run and they can still do that. But there are guys that just, don't need to be there. You know, it's not good for them. It's not good for the program. So I think you, they've got to change that. But I think that, um, you know, he's made the argument that they're one or two plays away and you take a look at it, you know, not to be an apologist, but yeah, they're, you know, you look at the Alabama game, yeah. one of seven different plays doesn't happen or happens. They win the South Carolina game. You tackle the guy on the opening kickoff. You win. Yeah. The, the, the center doesn't snap the ball you know, just for no reason whatsoever, yeah. you win. You know, they're there. I mean, Devon A.J. doesn't fumble inside the five. Evan Stewart catches a touchdown pass against Mississippi State. You're there. And they know this. I mean, but the fact of the matter is they've still got so much talent, you know, even if it's still developing, that they shouldn't have to be just there. They should be over the hump. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of the, the quandary here. And, and it's like, we all know Jimbo's a very good coach. We all, no one is saying that he's terrible at coaching or, or, or anything or any aspect of his program. He can obviously recruit. I mean, all those things, but then it gets on the field and they can't 
win games that they're supposed to win. They they go to South Carolina, you know, and a- after a bye week and on the opening kickoff, let you know this guy just run 64 yards down the field. Haynes King comes to check at the line, and I understand it's a backup center and those kinds of things, but he just snaps the ball for it's it, it's sort of maddening to just sort of see there's no progression here. There's they're not getting better as the season's getting right. longer. Yeah. In in some cases, they're actually regressing, I think, yeah. uh, especially on the offensive line. Some of that's injury. Some of it is, you know, the, 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 there's a disconnect between the players and the coaches on the offensive line. You know, but you take a look at recruiting, um, you know, obviously you've got the great class for 22. A lot of those guys are contributing. I think a lot of those guys will be long-term contributors. The 23 class, they're doing just fine. You know, you look at the – uh, you know, the rating per player for AM is like, I think, second only to Ohio State. Yeah. The problem is they're cleaning house at offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, and secondary. They do not have a single skill position player yeah. committed. Yeah. And therein lies the rub. And that's where they're going to have, that's another reason that they got to make some changes. Because how are you going to sell your program to an offensive player right now? Yeah. It's a tough sell. You've got to you got to resell it on the Evan Stewart to the world to make sure they stick around. Uh, but that's you know I think that's one of the reasons that they'll, they'll make a change. And I think that because of the timing of all this, they'll have to be active in the transfer portal this year, as opposed to stacking up a big class, which they really couldn't do anyway because they just don't have that much space. Yeah. Yeah. In no way am I comparing Jimbo Fisher as a coach to Chad Morris, but when Chad Morris at Arkansas lost the team, I believe it was at Mississippi State that the players pregame were flirting with the cheerleaders from Mississippi State and talking to them and trying to get numbers. And obviously the focus was not there, let's say. Something similar allegedly happened at, at South Carolina last week. How does, obviously players have been suspended and things are obviously not going to be taken lightly in that situation. But what does it say about players that are either goofing off on the sideline or doing something a little bit more nefarious? And where does that sort of stand? Well, one, uh, you know, you take a look at the guys who have been suspended. For two of them, it's the second time. Yeah. It's seven games. And, I mean, at that point, it's not just disrespect to the coaches. It's disrespect to your teammates. And there's just no place for it. You know, they got to go, in my opinion. Um, I think that what they got in trouble for, if if it's accurate, is one of the most stupid things I've ever heard of. And you don't want that around a team anyway. I mean, that right. just, that's just utterly moronic. But one of the, you know, you talk about, you know, a problem in the locker room. Again, that goes back to addition by subtraction. But one of the things that, makes you have hope that the team is still very much in, in Jimbo's corner is the fact that it was their teammates that turned them in that just like, you know, we're not going to put up with this crap. Yeah. And you know, that that's the real positive aspect of it. When you have guys on the sideline who are laughing when you're losing, those guys don't tend to stick around very long. Right. Because not only do the coaches not want them there, the other players don't want them there. And the reaction that you're seeing on social media from the other players is them saying, no, we're, I'm on board. We're on board. You know, if these other guys, you know, if they're going to separate themselves, then fine, you know, via con Dios. But I don't think that the program as a whole has been lost, but there are individual players who are now at the point of no return. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting at, okay, last question, sitting at three and four, and, and you know, really, uh, things are, are, have been pretty bad the last few weeks, although close, close losses, but still losses. Everyone thinks Texas A&M sucks and is terrible and will never win again. That's where I think Ole Miss might be in trouble this weekend. You know, it, it's ju- that's just how college football works. But how do you see this? How, how do you see the rest of the season continuing? Is it, is it still these these errors that should have been corrected an offense that really doesn't move the ball, but a defense that kind of holds in there some close losses, some close wins, or do you see something changing as we move through Ole Miss, Florida, Auburn, 
Thankfully, they get UMass and then finishing up with LSU. Well, one thing that changes is they're at home the rest of the way. Yeah. Except for Auburn. And Auburn's just not very good. Yeah. I was surprised at how easily LSU ran, moved the ball on Ole Miss this past weekend. And I think that if they get out there and they run the ball with Devon A. Chain, then, you know, they can make some make things happen. It's so tough to gauge them right now because, one, you know they have a terrible offensive line. And, two, you just don't know who the quarterback is. Do yeah. you really throw Haynes King back out there after he separated his throwing shoulder last week? I mean, that's that's tough. And, you know, in I would not. I would put Connor Wiegman out there and say, okay, this is your ball club the rest of the season. Yeah, Let's see what you got. Um, and I think that the the fan base would react positively to that. They want to see this kid as badly as anybody. So you got to figure out who your quarterback is for one thing, and that's always rough in week eight. Uh, you know, now you've got one of your wide receivers who is essentially gone, so you've got to replace him. You've already had Anaya Smith get hurt. Yeah, you got You got all these things they got to figure out, and they've got to stop the run against a, a run heavy team. So, you know, it's it's just real tough because you're like you see flashes. You know, the second half against Alabama, they played really good football yeah. on both sides of the ball. Uh, there were times against South Carolina that they played really good football, but the first five minutes were just a disaster. You know, can they put all this together, and can they be disciplined? Because it's just the same stupid stuff. False starts, uh, you know, the the, the bad snap, uh, blowing your run fit, things like that. If they can get these things sorted, they can compete with anybody. But will they? They haven't yet. You know, what's going to turn it around? You know, you know they got the talent. They got the potential. They still haven't proven it yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, like we said, last play against Alabama, they could have won it. After a disastrous five minutes against South Carolina, they outscored them 24 to 13 the, the rest of the way. You know, I mean, th this is not a team that's completely terrible. It's just, uh, you know, we'll see as they go along if those mistakes could be fixed. That is Mark Passwaters from AggieL.com. I am Adam Gorney. That is the Respect My Decision podcast.